So today we're talking about the first chakra. We're talking about having a strong foundation in life. I want to talk about this as in part of this series, I'm doing a series about all the different chakras and how they flow together and how they work together. And this one's really important, especially in the spiritual community, because we talk a lot about the idea of, I need to get grounded. You know, I think, I don't know, I don't even know where that came from. I don't know whether people were going to teachers and the teacher said to someone, you need to get grounded. And this whole idea started, um, I don't know, being born all over the place. And so there's things like earthing and being outside in nature and having your feet on the ground and all that kind of thing. And all these things are awesome, but my sense of the need for earthing, the need for grounding is actually more practical than that. Like if you're not grounded and you simply go outside in bare feet, that's not going, that's not going to ground us. That's a, it's like an idea. And it's really important if we tend to really be in our heads or really into kind of the spiritual realm of things, the simple act of just going outside with bare feet, that's not the end of the grounding experience, you know? And so I really want to talk about that because, you know, I do energy grid readings for people. And, and one of the big things, and especially if people aren't grounded in the first chakra because it, it maps um, your basic wiring, and some people are very naturally grounded. They're very naturally practical. They're very na they naturally manifest any idea they have. And other people don't have planets in the first chakra or the lower chakras. So it's really easy to kind of stay in our heads and stay up here. And, you know, a walk in the woods isn't going to be enough. You know, <clears throat> there has to be something that really is a prolonged experience. And it's important because if we're not grounded, we can't access the rest of our gifts. Like we think, oh no, I can just stay in my head. But we can't. It doesn't work that way. If, I just, if we stay in our heads, it just swirls and it can't go anywhere. The only reason of, to have great thoughts is because they swirl down to the root chakra, to the earth. You know, it's like for me, I easily can stay in my head. I can just stay up here and ponder and philosophize and all that kind of thing. That's why for me, I mean, it's, it's a great blessing that we all get together like this almost every day, because this is what brings all of my thoughts here in, into the world. And it is so healthy for me to have, to be able to discuss this with you guys because it, it almost makes it real. It makes all these thoughts, because otherwise, I'm just journaling and writing, and, and, you know, and sometimes I do write books and all that, but even those have to have some application in the world, right? They have to, they have to matter. And so what's interesting for me, for example, like I, you know, I've always been a philosopher. I've always pondered spirituality even when I was really young like when I was 14 there was a magazine called prevention and it was all about alternative cures and mind-body connection and I learned how to do shiatsu out of it um, when I was 14 I would get rid of people's headaches by you know using shiatsu and stuff and then when my mom got sick I went more even more into the mind-body so it was sort of continuing this journey for me up into my head, up into the spirit realm. And so I easily am not grounded. So what I, what we're talking about today is a very uh, personal journey as well to actually, how do I actually be part of the village and not just stay in this uh, crystal palace of my mind and, you know, spirit kind of idea. And so I often wondered why the universe sent me um, a lovely dairy farmer to fall in love with. <laughs> because, you know, marrying a dairy farmer, 
and moving to the middle of nowhere. You know, because I continued on this journey, right? I'm all kind of spiritual, philosophical. And then what do I do? I go away and study mathematics, which sounds very sort of clinical or not clinical. It sounds very mathematical, but it's actually a philosophy. Mathematics is a, is a great philosophy of life and the world and the universe and patterns and all that. So I just sort of kept on building in, in that space. Then I married a farmer. And then I had babies. And I literally spent the next 17 years covered in cow manure, milking cows, having to get up in the morning to chore, having to get up in the night because cows were calving, my son having night terrors, my, like all these things. And it was really painful. Like it was really painful to actually come out of that, you know, spiritual place and say, God, I forget all that because you just have to get up. You just have to do the chores. You just have to get through the day. There's no time for philosophy any longer, you know. And so, you know, as lots of you guys know, this caused a lot of depression for me and a lot of losing of myself, losing of who I believe I really am. But the blessing coming out the other side was for me there, if, if someone has a philosophy about something, if it doesn't actually help us in the hard times, it's of no value. If it doesn't help you actually on the earth, that's not interesting. There's times that I'd, I'd love to sit around and philosophize and wonder and do thought experiments, totally. But if someone's actually giving advice, I don't know, I had enough years on the farm <laughs> that it's like... I don't know, I've been tired enough that it's like, this had better actually be on the earth. This is grounded, right? It has to be on the earth. And in our world today, we live in a very strange virtual space. And I don't mean just computers. I mean, everything becomes about money. Everything becomes about success. Everything becomes about what do I look like to others? Everything becomes about this weird creation that we're sort of trying to make people think about us as opposed to, but how are you? Are you okay? Are you happy? Are you rested? Do you feel inspired? Like we've forgotten about this person, this incarnation, and this is the beginning of real grounding is to actually live in our bodies, to actually live in our life, right? This is our incarnation. If you imagine the seven chakras and here in the seventh, where we are completely open, connected to the divine, when we are here, we are listening to intuition. When we are here, we are speaking. This is all energy. Right? All of this is energy, even, even speaking. I'm simply putting energy to sound. Right? I'm just, that's all this is. This is all energy. And as we continue down through the chakras, we go, ooh, now I'm in the heart. Now I'm feeling other people and I'm connecting. And now I'm in my, my third chakra. Whoa, I exist now. Right? In the third chakra, it's like, whoa, I'm an incarnation. We're all individual incarnations. Whoa, we're all different, but we're here. Like, this is real, as real as it can be for being, you know, magnetized energy. This is real. And then I go down into my second chakra. I start interacting with you. And in the first chakra, I am in the village. I am in nature. I am on this earth. This is the point of all of this. For some reason, these magical souls incarnated here on the earth. So the first chakra is the point. <laughs> right? this, that's why we came into physical form. To have a physical experience here on the earth. If we stay up here in the ethers and we don't bring it down into our lives, we've missed the point. Like we've missed the point of being alive, 
right? We're not just philosophical beings. So it's a really interesting thing. And as soon as we find the place where we fit, you know, the community, how we manifest, how we help, how we share, how we really feel like we're on the earth, everything else makes sense. All of our gifts make sense. All of our challenges make sense as long as it's actually in the world, you know? So I want to talk about first, I want to talk about a number of things, but the first thing I want to talk about is why we get disconnected from the first chakra. Imagine that. Imagine that we're naturally grounded, right? When energy is flowing, we naturally, obviously are part of the world. You know, we all, gravity holds us to the earth. You know, we are part of the earth. So why do we feel disconnected from that first chakra? Why do we get disconnected from our own bodies? Why do we get disconnected from the village? What happens there? So there's a few things. There's many things. One of the things that can happen is that we have a difficult first seven years of our life. When we've had difficult family, maybe we had challenges with parents or parents not being there at all. Maybe we had abuse. Maybe we had struggles with poverty and not having enough and just always this fear. But especially when it was difficult, like difficult in our soul, our psyche will naturally take all of that experience and sort of set it aside, like wall it away like a trauma and say, you know what, I have to keep going. I have to go to school. I have to do whatever I have to do so I can't think about this all the time or else I'm kind of going to kind of just implode in the center of this drama. So this is a thing, right? So imagine suddenly, you know, you're 50 and you've disconnected from your first chakra or you're 20 or you're 30 or whatever because of a difficult childhood. It's kind of like you can imagine that in your mind you say, okay, you know what? Unconsciously, I'm just going to forget that even happened. I'm just going to, I'm going to forget about it because it's too much. I'm just going to start here and I'm going to build. This is a very healthy adaptation to a trauma. It's not a negative thing. That's how we survive. That's how human beings were made to survive this place. But at some point, but of course what happens is we've now cut ourselves off from our root chakra. So what will be the challenges in our life? All of these ungrounded things. You know, maybe we struggle to feel connected in the community. Maybe we struggle to keep a job. Maybe we struggle financially. Maybe we struggle to feel safe in relationship, feel safe in the world. And eventually, as we sort of come to a place in our life where we feel safe enough to look at those things, we get to then revisit those first seven years. We get to revisit that trauma. Almost like, you know, when you do um, processes where you envision your four-year-old self and you actually hold them, you know, or you sit and talk to them and you talk, you know, you actually bring the wisdom of, of age to that little child who's afraid, who's fright, you know, who's, who's, who's afraid. And so there's a lot of interesting healing we can do to reintegrate that child into our psyche so that we can reconnect with our own foundation. It's a, it's a really big deal. The other thing that flows through our first chakra is our ancestral inheritance. So if you, again, some people aren't wired into their ancestry and some people are, but if you're wired into the ancestry, you literally like, and let's say it's kind of not great. What if the tribe you've come out of, they're a little mean or a lot mean, or they have issues or they have belief systems that really 
don't work for you. What do we do? Okay, I'm just going to cut them out and I'm going to go forward as a soul. Again, very, very healthy adaptation to being born into a warring clan, you know, or however we understand it. This is a, a very healthy thing to do. But again, what's happened, so then as we continue through life, we are disconnected from our own history. We're disconnected from our own foundation of who we are. So at some point in life, we develop this lovely witness mind. We meditate and meditate and meditate, <laughs> trying to sort out my own thoughts from this ancestral inheritance that's rolling through my consciousness, either positively or negatively, but man, it's like they're all in the room all the time. You know? And this can look like a lot of things that can literally be like going into a relationship and, the, and you're with this person and you've brought generations of drama, generations of pain into this relationship. And, you, you know, there's this part of you that just says, can you guys all leave so that I can have a new experience here? So there's this point where we really do that. And when I say do the work, I mean, if we simply create the witness mind, that safe place inside, that we can actually sort out, okay, hold on a minute. What is my ancestors? What is my parents' stuff? And what's, what, what's, what are my thoughts? You can even write it down on a piece of paper. I love a piece of paper with lists or with columns. Here are, are what my grandparents believed. Here are what, is what my parents believed. Here is what I believe. And sorting out these strings and when we can do that, we can start to weave the ancestors back into ourselves. And, and we don't have to weave in what they believed like we like it. We can look at it and say, wow, I totally am not like that. And that contrast helps me know that, oh, that's who I am because I'm not this. So then we can still weave in those, those threads, even though they're not who we are. But that is where we came from. And again, this then energetically knits us back into our first chakra. You know, to find that a construct or something that allows everything to weave together so that I get to be whole. Me in this incarnation and everything that I've come out of. Because as long as we feel completely energetically disconnected from them, we easily become disconnected from our first chakra. So then we, fe we spend a lot of our life feeling unsafe, not a part of, you know. And, and the hardest thing about that is, is when, when we're disconnected from the first chakra, this, this stimulates first chakra fears. These are primal fears. These are wired into us. This is our reptilian brain that says, if we get kicked out of the tribe, we're going to, we're going to die. You know, we, we can't do that with it. We must not be abandoned. We have to always be part of the tribe. We always have to have this. And when that primal reptilian self is activated, we're not thinking up here at all, right? We're not, we're, we're not capable of reason. We're just trying to survive. So it's really interesting, it's really valuable to kind of do that, take that personal journey of, of sewing up our own first seven years plus and the ancestry that came before that. The other thing that's interesting is some people truly just aren't wired into their lower chakras. You know, and again, I'm speaking within the context of these energy grids that I do for people, which are like astrology. It's like saying, you know, if someone is an earth sign, they're kind of naturally grounded, that kind of idea. And so for people who just simply aren't wired into the first chakra, there's lots of bonuses to this, right? You can be kind of a gypsy. You can travel all over. You don't feel rooted in one place. Like literally, you don't feel rooted. You can go anywhere. But it's still really important 
to do things that ground or else we don't get to access all these other lovely gifts. So for example, if I do a grid for someone and they have no planets in the first chakra, one of the number one things they do need to do is exercise. You know, they need to move their body every day in a way that takes them out of their brain and into their body. Like, it can't be Tai Chi or even Hatha Yoga or things like that where you're sort of still and the mind, you know, can still go. I think that's why I'm so drawn to Kundalini Yoga because it takes all of this and it forces it into my body. It forces it to flow where if I do a more uh, still practice, my mind, it won't get me out of my mind. It doesn't actually bring me into my body. I stay in my mind, right? Walking in nature is very grounding if you're not naturally wired that way. If we, if we don't have any planets in the first chakra, we'll do a lot of things that are naturally grounding. One of them is eating. Eating is very grounding. It's, it's literally so, it's so tactile and it's so nurturing. So if we don't have planets in the first chakra, it's really easy to struggle with weight because we're, when, as soon as we start flying, you know, and feeling ungrounded, we'll eat and we'll instantly hit the ground. But unfortunately that can also create weight. Like you imagine, right? Even the, the idea of gaining weight is grounding, right? It makes you feel so, more solid on the earth. Another big thing we do to ground is smoke cigarettes. You know, smoking cigarettes is a very grounding thing. It's in the breath. It causes you to breathe deeply. I'm not recommending taking up smoking cigarettes. I'm just saying it's a very grounding thing. So when we're not feeling grounded, um, I used to love smoking. And if I was really spinning and I would have a cigarette, I was suddenly on the planet again not the healthiest for me. Well, it's not healthy at all for me, but it, uh, it, it's really, really grounding. So it's cool to find things instead like exercise, being in nature, things like that to help us ground besides that. There's also a lot, there's other reasons that are a bit less um, part of our wiring. So for example, being super heady, being a super intelligent person, um, I don't mean smart, I mean intel that intelligence is a really big deal. So it could just be that maybe in your family or in your world, education is really, really important. And the accumulation of knowledge is really, really important. So all the, all the energy stays up here, right? In the brain, in the sixth chakra. And it's interesting in that culture, because in that culture, manifestation isn't so important. It doesn't really matter what you do. It doesn't really matter if you have a job. It doesn't really matter if you contribute to the village. There's almost a, a joy in the thinking. And there's a, a praise in thinking a lot. It's like, so that, there's a challenge there. If you come out of a culture or a family where you are praised for simply having this intellect, you know, it's an interesting challenge because it keeps us all up here and it doesn't let us, it almost, it almost makes uh, anything else kind of lowly. You know, it's kind of that, oh, I wouldn't do that job. That's a, a blue collar job. I do a white collar job. Like there's a lot of that in the world, right? That, oh, I wouldn't do that working with my hands. You know, I'm a, I'm a professional person, right? So there's a lot of interesting cultural things that we learn that actually keep us away from doing things that ground us. It keeps us up here because this kind of work is considered above, you know, physical work or that kind of thing. So that's an also an interesting thing to philosophically ask ourselves, do I believe there's something wrong with working with my hands? Do I believe there's something wrong with people who are in the trades or people who are in service industries, like who are, who are in the village doing this? 
it's an interesting question because it's a huge thing in most societies that the goal is to move up here and forget about everything in the lower chakras, which is a huge reason why becoming grounded is so challenging because we actually poo-poo the things that ground us, <laughs> right? Like we've been almost culturally, um, it's been stolen from us. It's funny, I had a, I have a friend who's um, super wealthy and I stayed with him for a while in my travels. So it was really interesting because I hung out with all of these millionaires and billionaires, which is not my pa uh, past. It's not where I come from. It's not, it's not even a culture I've ever really been a part of. You know, my parents were teachers. You know, we were just kind of whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. So we, it was, there was always a struggle for money, you know, that kind of having to work, having to work two jobs, having to work three jobs, having to, you know, that sort of my understanding of money. So hanging around people who were millionaires, born into it, it, they inherited it, was fascinating. Like it was just, it was absolutely fascinating. And I could probably do an entire talk just on the life of millionaires. <laughs> but in this instance, in the, in, the, in the context of losing connection with the first chakra, that is probably one of the number one things I saw there was, you know, one guy, he was really, he was investing in a meditation app. And one day, and they, they had done a, um, a survey as to why people meditated. And the number one reason people meditated was to handle stress. And he looked at me and he said, I don't understand. What are they so stressed about? Why aren't they using meditation to expand their minds? I don't understand. And I looked at him and I realized inside of me, I thought, wow, you've never wondered if you could pay the rent. You've never wondered if you could make the minimum payment on your credit card. You've never wondered if you, you've never not gotten your kid braces because you couldn't afford them. You know, you've never not fixed your car because you couldn't afford to. It's never been a thing. In his strata, in his group of people, whatever you want to call it, they don't work because they have to make money. They just work to make money or they just work to do whatever. There's other reasons for working or <laughs> they inherited whatever, this monstrous job. It's not all, I'll tell you right now, it's, it's not all pretty in the in the billionaire club and but it was really interesting to me to realize how grounding it is to have to work to pay rent like this isn't I mean I'm, I'm not saying there isn't challenges in that like in any way I'm just saying this is grounding this actually puts us on the earth as soon as we have to work we have to show up in order to pay for the kids' braces, to fix the car, to put gas in the car, as hard as it can be, it keeps us real, right? It keeps us honest. It keeps us practical. You know, when you sit and talk to someone who's been through, you know, when you sit and, you know, I, I have this vision of going and sitting on a park bench with someone who's 80 or 90, these people are practical. They've been through the war. They've been through the depression. They've been through, you know, they've been through all these really difficult times. They've been placed on the earth and they had to build. This is grounding and it's really valuable. So sometimes even the families we're born into or the belief systems of, I want to make a million dollars. I want to make six figures. I want to like, you know, and <laughs> We already did the talk about how money's weird, but it's really, really interesting how sometimes society and what we're aiming for is, is actually completely disconnecting us from 
the first chakra, from the village, from nature, from the community, from everything. And the crazy thing is, it also connect, disconnects us <clears throat> here. It disconnects us from our own bodies. It disconnects us from everything. So it's a very, it's a very interesting thing sometimes when we look at people of, in wealth or people in um, jobs that aren't grounded. They suffer. That's really, really hard. I remember one time I had a friend who, uh, they were an executive banker. <clears throat> and every year they would struggle, struggle with this, struggle with this. They would always be having all of this, all this uh, politics going on in inside the bank and all that kind of thing. And so every time there's a promotion, they would call me and they'd just be like, oh, you know, and they're pulling their hair out. And I'd always listen to them and think, you know what, you know what's pro the problem is? You know, you don't build chairs. At the end of the day, you don't have a thing that you made that you can look at and say, ah, oh, that is a work of art. Someone is going to sit on that chair. Like we need as humans, we need to manifest. We need to actually matter. We need to actually be a part of the society. So it's interesting, this idea of grounding. Not only do we have to look at the emotional things of our childhood, the ancestral stuff, we really have to look at our societal conditioning that is actually taking us away from everything that really grounds us. And this is what I mean, like, it isn't just, I'm just going to go for a walk in the woods to ground me, or I'm just going to go outside barefoot to ground me. No, we have to be in the community. We have to be in society. We actually have to affect other people. Then the grounding becomes energetically a thing right then it really flows because that's why we're incarnate that's why we're here we're here to be a part of the community to be a part of nature it's uh i think that's why when we do uh physical exercise it's such a big deal like real physical exercise not you know i just did a few things i mean we really work our body such a big deal because even when you go back like I remember being on the farm you worked like especially when we were haying or doing anything like that at the end of the day your body was tired like you like you were just you're just sort of like crawling into bed and you don't dream either when you're that tired normally <laughs> at least I don't and you just sort of crawl into bed and you're like oh my gosh you're so tired and then you wake up the next day and you continue this very interesting grounded experience. Just wild. The other thing that's a really interesting way to come into our bodies, beyond all of the social conditioning and everything, for all of it, whether we've experienced trauma that's disconnected us from our first chakra, whether we've um, our first family, wealth, our jobs, stress, whatever, whatever it is that's disconnected us, there are some things we can do. Maybe we can't change all that right now. <laughs> right? Maybe we're knee deep in all that and we can't change it. There are interesting things we can do. And one of them is really connecting with our five senses. Because our five senses, they are our connection to the earth plane. We are designed to experience this world through sight, sound, hearing, touch, smell. This is what we are. That's what this incarnation does. So it's designed to feel. So if you're feeling ungrounded and you need to, and maybe you can't change all these other things, you know, that, that's, that's all good, right? We're all we're all on a journey. Then one thing we can do is dive into our senses. So for example, if you go for a walk in the woods, don't listen to music. <laughs> don't listen to a podcast. If you go running, stay in your body and dive into your senses. Feel your body. Feel the earth underneath you. 
Look around you. Really focus on every little detail that you see. If you're in the woods, look at the critters. Look at the leaves. Look at the way the light shines through the leaves. Look at the earth underneath you. Smell. Remember to smell. Smell the earth. Smell the air. Smell everything. You know, listen. Just listen. Listen to the birds. Listen to the sound of your feet crunching in the in the grass wherever in the in the woods taste be aware even right now what does it taste like in your mouth what does this taste like what does that taste like like really dive into your senses or let's say even touch when you're making love because you know we're going to talk about making love when you're making love be in your body Anybody who's disconnected from our first chakra for any of the reasons we've talked about are not in their body when they're making love. They're thinking about the next thing. What are they thinking? Do they like this? Oh, I haven't had an orgasm yet. They haven't. Oh my God, blah, blah, blah. There's, they are existing while they're making love in the same way they're existing all day long. So what do you do? Breathe. Smell the other person. Feel their touch. Touch them. Experience that. Like, listen. Everything. Dive into our senses no matter what. And if you don't have a partner and you can't do it, then we do it ourselves. And we create a hypersensory experience. You know, maybe you drop the lights, turn, put on candles so your eyes get to see something different and natural. We need natural things to look at through our eyes to ground. Fluorescent lights and TVs and all this, this does not ground through our, our optic nerve. We need to see natural things. So maybe in your rooms, you quiet the light, or you quiet the lights, you turn the lights off, light candles, and then you put something smelly, right? Maybe you light a candle, you do some, or you cook, you know, bake muffins or something that the sensory is so lovely and you're like, and you smell, deeply smell, and then you sit quietly and you listen. You know, right now I listen and I can hear the furnace going and I can hear the fridge going and I can hear this thing, you know, these are what I'm hearing. Create, and then maybe you lie in bed and you just do this lovely touch, this like tantric touch that you're fully conscious and aware and you feel or maybe you give yourself a massage with amazing oils. Dive into the senses and we will become part of our bodies again. And it's really interesting because especially if you're healing, maybe you're healing from emotional trauma. Maybe you're healing from that first seven years that I talked about or ancestral stuff or whatever. It's through this that memories will come up, right? When you actually are in your body because this is what we've been running from our whole life we've been running from having a sensory experience it's a huge part of why so many people like don't love sex don't love intimacy don't love any of those things because we can't connect with our first chakra it's uncomfortable so even the journey of doing this on our own helps to un unwrap all the things that have gotten you know, clamp down over time. If someone was to say, well, what am I supposed to do for a living if I'm not supposed to be a, an executive banker? We're just going to pick on bankers right now. What am I supposed to do? Well, you know what the answer is? Go do something physical. <laughs> you know? Go for a run. Do some vigorous kundalini yoga. Do some beautiful sensual experience, like sensual of the senses experience get in your body and something a new solution will happen you know it's a it's very 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 cool and of course the other big piece about grounding is being in nature like real nature not you know crafted lawns and parks but if you can get to real nature even a sea or an ocean 
but definitely nature where there's trees and sand or anything, but something real. And it's also really good to do it alone, to be in nature by yourself. Because as soon as there's another person, we're going to engage in a different level, maybe through the heart or through the mind. But if we're alone, we will commune with nature. And as soon as we do that, we may find other solutions. You know, we actually, it's like our soul remembers, we remember what this body is really made for, what our incarnation, why we're here. It's, uh, it's all very possible. This is the most beautiful thing about healing the first chakra is it's all here. It's all within us. It's literally, we have all the medicine right here, <laughs> right in our fingers and our nose and our eyes and our tongue. Like this is all right here. And, uh, and the last thing I just want to mention is, you know, let's say you live in a place where there's not a lot of nature. One of the most beautiful, there's a beautiful movie called uh, Phenomenon with John Travolta. One of my all-time favorites that I've literally watched so many times that I know it off by heart. And he gets hit by this light from the sky no one knows what it is and his mind becomes you know it's almost like that accessing more than five percent of your brain or ten percent of your brain or something but of course there are times that he starts to swirl and it's all very confusing and what would bring him down down to earth was to look up into the trees and watch the wind blow through the trees that beautiful movement of the wind through the trees is what would bring him down and centered. And I think of that a lot, especially if I find myself inside or I find myself in a place where I can't get out, I can't get to nature, I can't, I don't know, do whatever I need to do. And then I just look outside the window and I just watch a tree, you know, especially if I can't see the houses behind it. And I just look out and I just watch the trees, watch a squirrel run along it or something, you know. Very, very, very grounding. My son wrote a book as a child, The Leaf, that followed me to school, and I use this concept frequently to help. That's amazing. That's so cool. It's funny, my friend said something like that to me the other day, or she messaged, she wrote it down. Um, we were talking about the challenge of, of being grounded and feeling a part of nature. And my friend lives in Toronto, um, right downtown, so it's a bit hard for her to find nature a lot, especially in the wintertime. In the summer, it's a bit easier. She's really into moss, so she sees moss everywhere, all over the buildings and the the streets and everything, and that's her bit of nature in the middle of the concrete jungle, you know. And she said that she would connect with nature, that when she went shopping, like grocery shopping, and bought food, like bought berries and vegetables and stuff, and every time she would hold these plants in her hands that she was going to eat, she, like, was thankful for them. Which is so interesting, right? It's so interesting to just simply even imagine, you know, the plants that you're going to eat to actually just connect with them. It's really beautiful. And there's always messaging app stuff. You can be so busy. You know, it's so interesting. It, you're so right. Like, for me, my, I, I really, I really actually discipline myself to, uh, turn my phone off a lot like I actually act like it's 20 years ago and the phone is hanging on the wall at home and if I leave the house it doesn't come with me because I lived most of my life with my phone on the wall in the house and if I went for a walk I was just going for a walk and if I was with my friends, I was out with my friends. You know, I wasn't, 
I, I don't want all that stimulation. I'm more, I am heavily stimulated. I don't require anybody beeping in at me. And remember before voicemail, I know it's a big thing. It's uh, and it's interesting because what happens is when you stop, um, when you stop carrying your phone with you, when you stop answering emails, like I don't have email on my phone or anything like that. And I only answer emails once a day or once a, like I don't, I don't, I'm not tied to that. And people know that, and my kids are the same too. They actually taught me this a lot. They're like brutal to get a hold of. If they're not, like they don't sit on their phone at all. And so I actually realized that, wow, I just adjust to them. I have friends, like I have my intuitive friend that I talked to you guys about. She doesn't even have a cell phone at all. Like she has a computer, but she doesn't have a cell phone. So if you don't get her at home or leave a message, you don't get her because she's out in the world. Many of my teachers, like Norma, who I've talked about, she doesn't even have internet and no computer, definitely no phone. She has like a, a landline and that's it. Jim, who I've talked about many times, never, ever touches a computer, no cell phone, no nothing. He's out in the woods living or he's with his family living. So my great teachers, like, who are alive right now, I don't mean like Einstein or someone, like, in my life, they have landlines, and they are the most expansive people I know. So I really enjoy having my phone turned off a lot. <laughs> How long does it take to be grounded? <laughs> I, for me... You know, it could be instant and it could take many, many years. You know, it depends if we, this is where the philosophy is so interesting. That, so let's say, for example, the reason you're not grounded is because you want, you want to be in that executive realm and I'm just going to use that in air quotes, executive realm, like whatever that is. I want to be in this, you know, focused on money, focused on prestige, focused on success, focused on this. That's what I want. So then I say, well, how long will it take for you to get grounded? Probably never. Right? As, as long as that's the goal, that as long as that's your intention, the intention is to not be grounded. So then we have to back up and we have to look at it and say, now hold on a minute. What if I, and again, this is extreme, I'm not saying anyone should do it, but what if I quit my job and I started, you know, cleaning houses for a living or I started, you know, I start apprenticing with my friend who's an electrician and I start going and doing jobs that are actually instantly physical. You're going to become grounded like that, you know. If you find someone who can help you know, look at that trauma. Look at whatever's going on in your early life. Or maybe you personally find a personal practice that's allowing you to actually go into those emotions. As soon as you go into those emotions, you're grounded. You're in your body. You're in the experience. It's instant. And the more, and then it just becomes this beautiful, gradual thing. But as long as we run from it, it'll never It'll never work. What kind of goals would I set to stay grounded? Or is the goal setting already not grounding? <laughs> no, th th it's really important. Because if we're not naturally grounded, for, ma for example, for me, I have to convince, because I'm not naturally grounded. So I have to actually say, to I have to set a goal, and I have to say, we use our gifts, right? And if goal setting is a gift, then use it to help get grounded. <laughs> I have to say, Katrina, you're going to go for a walk every single day. You're going to do your yoga every single day. You're going to go for a run three times a week. I, if I don't set those goals, I will be up here and three weeks will go by and I'll have forgotten that I ever had this great idea. So it's okay to set a goal. The key is you have to actually do the goal. 
you actually have to you have to do the plan for the goal, right? That's that's the whole thing. It, it, as long as you manifest it, that's all that matters. Because the thing is, if we're not grounded, we make plans, we set goals, we make vision boards, we do all, which are all awesome. I'm not taking away from any of it, but we do all the things, but then we don't do them. <laughs> right? We have to do them. That's the foundation of being grounded. When you discussed moving away from the root chakra, being connected to childhood difficulties, were you saying we have to reconnect with the family of origin? Not always. Sometimes our family of origin is really broken and it's really dysfunctional and it's really painful. And reconnecting there isn't the answer because there's a reason you disconnect it. I have many, many friends whose families of origin are really cruel and the recommendation would never be for them to reconnect with that. But to reconnect with your experience within it is important because what we do is we disconnect. It's like we actually almost create our own blackout so that we don't remember anything from it and that's what disconnects us. So if we reconnect with our experience inside of it, that's what weaves it back together. We don't have to go back into the fire. A lot of people are exactly the same as they were 40 years ago or whenever it was that caused us to have to leave, to survive, right? So it, this isn't about, oh, I, I, you know, there's no way I can reconnect with them because some families are really, really mean and it's not safe to go there. But to reclaim our own experience, it's kind of like, imagine you're a soldier that went to war and you had horrific experiences and the, the fallout from that is still causing you know, ripple effects in your body and constantly having these um, reactions. So we kind of disconnect from it in order to survive. But what if some of those things are still flowing, right? So somehow we have to reconnect with them in a safe way, but we don't have to go back to war. You know, so in a lot of ways, that's what it's like reconnecting with our family of origin. And so no, I'm not I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> How does one know about the planets and chakras? I do energy grid readings, and that's how, that's what I'm talking about there. Um, and you can do it here through Insight Timer. If you click on my profile, um, you can do it here. You can do it through my website, but we do it here on Insight Timer too. So it's uh, how to create safety when it's so hard to trust people emotionally. This is where the, the safety is all inside. It's all inside. Like even trusting people emotionally to know that when, um, if someone hurts me, I'm solid. Like I'm not dependent on you being emotionally stable for my stability. And that's an interesting dance because as humans, we are interconnected. It's not, it's not, we're not islands. We are interconnected, but the safety comes in here. And once we become, once we really feel what, I have the word like homeostasis in my head, but that's not right. It's like, once we really feel that clarity inside, if someone comes up and they're emotionally unstable, we stay here and let them be their rocking ocean right? But we're here and we kind of get this look on our, this is me, I swear, you have no idea how often I look at people going. Because <laughs> I'm just sort of waiting for their waves to slow down because I don't have to dive into their waves anymore. Whereas his, historically, I dove into their waves big time. And uh, so it all just becomes, it's all just our own inner safety. And then even if we do dive in, I'm a, I'm a died in the wool romantic. I dive in all the time. And then I cry my eyes out, go for a run, eat some chocolate, 
and I come back to my center. <laughs> How do you develop that safety? If you've never, um, I'd probably recommend reading my first book, What If You Could Skip the Cancer, because that was my journey to inner safety. Before that, you know, I, it was in my head, I was caught up in other people, I was a people pleaser, all that kind of thing. And that, and cancer was the, the catalyst in my life just over 20 years ago that forced me to choose something else. And it forced me into my heart, into faith, however you understand that. It forced me into a different space of real inner trust, knowing also in that safety that when I can become grounded and centered in myself, um, I also hear guidance. So I'll always have guidance out of the difficult spot. So if you're new to my world, I'd, I'd recommend reading that book. It's, um, yeah. So thank you so much for being here. And I will see you later. <laughs>